So, I'm sorry about the print. I've put this together. Um, I've been on the road the last few days and, uh, uh, and less well prepared than what I'd like to be. But uh, nevertheless, let's, uh, let's get started and, and I'll tell some stories, I think, and uh, give my impressions of, of what I've learned. Um, some things have worked well and some things have not worked so well throughout my career. Um, as Bill was saying, I've got a background. I'm a geographer originally by training, which was a discipline that prided itself on being about integrated approach to understanding the world, people and places, and solving the problems. And I don't know how it is in Sweden, but in, in Australia um, and in other parts of the world, geography has suffered you know, major decline as it was seen to be less relevant to the, or less competitive perhaps, to the needs of the real world. I think that's a great shame because now we spend a lot of time trying to get back to a more integrated approach to natural resource management. But I worked in fisheries, I worked in land use planning to begin with, fisheries. Um, spent a long, probably 10 years of my career working in politics as a political advisor in ministers' offices at the state and federal level. And um, at one stage, you know, was heading for a career in politics that was luckily saved from that by, uh, by circumstances. Um, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was a very interesting part of my career and I think, you know, one I look back on with um, fondness because I think I learned uh, a lot of things that helped me later on. So, <laughs> even then I was a fan of Sweden, as you can see, from the headband. I think that was the third time my nose was broken. So at this stage in my, uh, my career, it was all about football and working outdoors. So what I wanted to do was to work outdoors. Whatever I did, I didn't want to end up in an office. I didn't want to end up in bureaucracy. Um, and uh, all I can say, really, looking at that photo, is that um, I knew a lot more then than what I know now. I knew it all then, um, but not enough to keep my nose out of uh, scrums and so forth, and uh, not enough to know that um, really, if you wanted to have a comfortable life, then natural resource management um, from an applied perspective is not, a, is not a comfortable place to be. I mentioned politics before, and I just wanted to talk, because we're, we're interested in, and we're talking this morning, um, over in the centre about uh, the role that entrepreneurs play and the role that um, these change makers can play in, in generating major outcomes. And I've just got a couple of photos here, people. The, the, the chap who's um, on my left, your right, is uh, Honourable John Kieran, who back in the 1980s, early in the 1980s, was the Australian Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. There wasn't, there might have been an environment minister, but if they were, they were kept locked away out in the back room, but this portfolio was much more powerful. And I look back um, and he, he found, I was working in Western Queensland doing land surveys, this land use planning, looking at land suitability and capability and so forth, and saw an ad in, in the national newspaper for you know, a, an advisor. He was in opposition at the time. And so I applied, um, from way out in Ewan and Cloncurry, wherever it was, and then caught the train all the way down to Brisbane. I'm just trying to get a sense of how long ago this was. And, uh, and we had this interview for the job. And he told me up front, look, I really want a lawyer because I'm really looking at legislative change. But what was interesting about the conversation was that he was, what he was saying is that what we're doing with our land and our sea and our forests, it just can't go on. I mean, words like sustainability weren't part of the vocabulary then. But he was, he, he had this vision, looking ahead. He was a farmer who then studied at night and um, got caught up in the whole Vietnam thing in Australia and got radicalised through that and um, joined the Labor Party, the Socialist Party, and, and then studied geography and economics and put himself through while running the family farm. But he had this vision that we were mining our resources, our natural capital, and that if we didn't do something about it, uh, the situation was going to get very bad, you know, at a, at a quick rate. So he, he was, he had this ability to look ahead. And, and when he spoke to me about these things, because I've been spending time out in the field, I said, this is absolutely true. I mean, we had 
the amount of soil erosion that's occurring out in western Queensland and New South Wales is horrendous. I mean, the rivers are silting up. What we're doing to our natural forests, um, we're just clear felling the forests. As for fishing, it was the sea was still limitless. And so this is the you know, mid-1980s. It's not that long ago, really, when you think about it. But he could see this. And he said about, and then after the conversation, I said to him, look, we'll never see each other again, but good luck. And um, I got on the train and then got a, you know, he got in contact with me sometime later and said, look, I've changed my mind, I don't need a lawyer. What I need is someone who shares the same vision because no one else in the bureaucracy seems to get it. So I became a, an advisor to him. And uh, he said about doing things that were radical, like saying, um, you know, fisheries should be managed through management plans where we're not exceeding the sustainable yield of the fisheries. People, is, people were sort of um, in the industry were very worried about this um, sort of talk in, in relation to farming. But it was an idea. The point I'm trying to make is it was his thinking had come coincided at a point in history where people were prepared for change in these issues. Um, and he was brave enough and bold enough and in a position to be able to stand up. So I was lucky enough to be coming along behind him as an advisor, being supported by him, being encouraged. I was all 22 years of age, something. You know, is it, is it luck? I don't, I don't know, but um, I certainly owe a great deal to his patronage and his mentoring and his ideas, which I then hopped on um, and rode the uh, slipstream. Oh, so I just wanted to mention, and from, from his thinking came a whole lot of natural resource management legislation because he became minister not long after, after the election was held and was elevated up to senior positions um, in the Australian government as the Minister for Prime Ministries, Energy and Resources and um, was able to make substantive changes, kick off fisheries management as we know it today in Australia from a national perspective bring about the end of, of forest logging in an indiscriminate way and put it on a much more sustainable and plantation basis um, and, and institute the uh, um, Land Management Act which saw soil conservation dealt with in a systematic way institutionally. And I remember that the thing that was that a lot of people thought he was crazy. They couldn't see why he should do it. Um, his colleagues couldn't see what was in it politically because um, all these people who were going to be affected were going to, you know, be outraged. There was going to be uh, negative press. And the bureaucracy in Canberra worked day and night to stop these ideas from going forward. They would come back with briefs that would come through me, which were this thick, about why it was a bad idea to do all these things. You know, the energy that went into it um, in terms of stopping it, um, but every now and then, he'd get a little bit of traction and he'd push, push on. So I just want to mention John and, and the importance of those sorts of entrepreneurs. He was a minister, so he was, in, it was, really, he was in a position to be able to drive an agenda of change and reform. Virginia Chadwick, who was the chair at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority when I was there, um, was instrumental in something I'm going to talk about shortly, which was the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park which I think it's fair to say is considered to be the single most concrete example of marine spatial planning, conservation advancement, um, sustainable, putting in place a sustainable ecosystem approach um, around the world. And she was the person who was the chair of the board. And I just want to mention her because she had no background in marine. And she was appointed chair, so I was the candidate for, to be chair. Had my heart set on it. You know, grew up in North Queensland. This was the job that I was after. She was appointed. So my, my politics were different to hers, I should say. So I was from the left. She was the government in Canberra was from the right at the time. That they appointed Virginia above me because they said I was politically unacceptable. Um, and I had a level of resentment about that as she came in because what would she know? You know, this was really my job to be done. Um, she had no background in marine. She was a teacher by profession. Um, but she was just a very, very canny political operator. She'd been a minister in the, um, 
in the uh, Liberal National Party government in New South Wales. She'd been Education Minister, so had a major portfolio. She was probably, I mean, I always think John was very smart politically. Um, he was probably more of the entrepreneur type with the ideas. He had the big ideas. Virginia had the skills. She knew how to manoeuvre her way through minefields to form alliances, to anticipate ambushes, to let you manage, to build up um, the resources to go forward. And, and had a and it was just a wonderful mentor for me and, and a great friend. And unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago. But um, you know, these are the people that make things happen. I think, and and we need to be able to identify the characteristics or how they came to their positions um, to be able to perhaps support these people, uh, whether they're in Sweden or in Indonesia or in Australia, wherever they are. Recognise what characteristics they have. Um, and get in there and support them. Because I'm sure for every success story that I talk about here, there's probably 20 failures of people who have similar characteristics but didn't manage to make it. I just want to, you know, I'm going to talk about a couple of issues, um, some to do with, organi to do with organisation and organisational management and, and how we go about policy formulation and some to do with individual characteristics and roles. But the issue of fragmentation in marine resource management is one that I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on and I know a lot of this is nothing new in this. But we've ended up in a situation uh, in marine resource management where we talk a lot about the need for an integrated approach. We probably understand the ecosystem and its limits and its functioning better than we ever have. Yet if you look at the human structures we've put in place, how we've organised ourselves to try and deal with the threats and the decline, it's highly fragmented. And, and the antithesis of an ecosystem and how it functions. Now why does this matter? Well I think, I think it matters because we end up spending a whole lot of time defending roles and patches and institutional boundaries which is all costs that come, uh, that are costs that, that bear on trying to get some sensible, practical outcomes. Nowhere is it more evident for me than in the area of fisheries. Whether it's fisheries science uh, or fisheries management, sorry, not fisheries, but in marine, whether it's fisheries science or fisheries management or so-called marine conservation, um, which is seen as a, a separate world altogether. And in Australia, it, it, you know, it, it gets integrated at times, but um, in many parts of the world, in Germany where I've worked and in other places, the distance between um, fisheries and marine management or marine conservation is huge. And the suspicion and the amount of energy that goes into protecting egos and cultures is huge, which, you know, you might say, well, that's human. But what bugs me about it is that this all comes in the cost of doing, getting practical outcomes. So people put an enormous amount of energy into, into stopping something going forward um, for the sake of, because it, it's not their idea or it's not their organisation or, you know, real men do fisheries management, greeny sort of effeminate types do marine conservation. And, you know, I mean, I'm being very trite here, but there is this real belief out there, and, and I suppose I feel, I see it clearly because I've worked. I was you know, chairman of Queensland Fisheries, so I was part of the, the fisheries world. And, um, and I've also been you know, executive director of Great Barrier Marine Park Authority, which is an ecosystem-based um, organisation. And I know that when I was approached to take the job at Kabumpa, the industry, the fishing industry, more broadly, not just the fishermen, but the bureaucrats in the boat, they all contacted me and said, you can't go over to the dark side. You can't go over there and do what they're going to do. I mean, they're about different stuff. I mean, they're about protecting stuff. There wasn't, there was very little recognition that we're actually all dealing with the one resources, the same ecosystem, um, the same planet, and, and essentially the same problems. Uh, there was an enormous amount of effort 
that went into making sure that the silos and the, and the demarcation remained strong. And then I was warned, you know, at the highest levels, whatever you do, if you're going to go over and join this greeny organisation, which by the way is a Commonwealth government agency, um, don't come anywhere near fisheries again. You've, you've burnt your bridges there, and uh, good luck in your new career, but don't ever come back in terms of, and think that you're going to impinge, use the knowledge that you've got to impinge on fisheries, which of course is the first thing I did when I, when I did, because that was the, where the need was, so when I went to Google, but, and it frustrates me sometimes, and I'm, I'm talking from very much from an Australian perspective or, or um, context here that I understand that many who get involved in marine biology and marine, so the pure marine sciences, feel excluded from marine resource management. And it's institutional barriers, well patrolled and defended by egos, um, often perhaps, I don't want to get into amateur cycle, but insecure egos who see that they need that protection that stop, that stop good, sensible ecosystem-based outcomes from evolving. And I think it's a very underestimated um, impediment to good marine resource management. It's very real. And I find it wherever I go around the world. So I just working in the Solomons not long ago, where um, they're developing a new legislation. It's a new country. It's just gone through its um, you know, the Civil War not long ago. And so they're starting afresh. And they're developing a Fisheries Act supported by New Zealand Fisheries designing it, and a Marine Conservation Act, two separate pieces of legislation being supported by an Australian, uh, Wollongong University, I think it is, it's helping them with that. And here you have a wonderful, you know, it's 2011 when I was working this, here's a wonderful opportunity to develop at least on a legislative, legislative basis and organisational implications would have come from an institutional arrangement. Some integrated legislation that recognised that the problems that affect fisheries are the same problems that affect the marine ecosystem. But no, it's, they're going separate ways, which will lead to entrenched defensive behaviour and I would argue poor ecosystem management as a consequence. Um, and really, you know, I've just put a, a photo down the bottom there that I found was this is where we should be at. It's about people and the places and they live and the ecosystems they depend on not about silos or um, technical fixes that, that one realm or discipline may be competing to try and put in place. Um, I won't, I won't uh, this, this slide I was going to use to probably just emphasise the same point, that every time I'm under the water diving um, to stay completely obvious, I can't take fish out of the ecosystem. And yet when I come up out of the, you know, take them out of in, in terms of where they fit and how they work, when I come up above the water, I find that we're neatly dividing the ecosystem up to fit our, um, our conceptual need to fragment, compartmentalise and feel secure within our, uh, within our limits. Um, okay, I'm going to swap now just to uh, another issue that we are talking about this morning is this issue of of leadership um, in conservation organisations. And I guess many of the things here would be true of, of different, different realms of management. First and foremost, I think to be a leader in a marine conservation organisation, or marine resource management organisation, you need to have a passion for the, for the task. You need to want to make a difference. Um, but the other thing you need to do, in my experience, is build a team. Build that organisational capacity of like-minded people who are similarly entrepreneurial um, and want to make change. And perhaps realise that they're not going to be there for a long time, for a comfortable time. Because it's a dynamic situation, much like the ecosystems you're trying to manage. Um, the energy required to make substantive change given the impediments that are around is substantive um, and you need to be able to work as a team, as part of a team and then move on. 
afterwards. So when I was, we undertook this exercise, which some people will be familiar with, where we're rezoning the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. So that's 300, uh, it hasn't come out on the slide, I'm sorry, my lack of PowerPoint expertise, but it's 350,000 square kilometres, a big area of water for those people who haven't been there. It runs most of the coastline of Queensland from the Torres Strait um, down to, not far, well, down to Fraser Island, essentially. Um, there'd been a belief around for probably the better part of 10 years that the arrangements that are in place to protect the Great Barrier Reef, the World Heritage Area, were inadequate and there was a need to do something about it. When I was brought in to the authority, I knew that there was a need to take on some big issues such as trawling um, in the marine park, as well as the level of no-take or protection. But looking around the organisation, I couldn't see the energy, I couldn't see the, the um, risk-taking elements, I could see a lot of technically highly competent people who had got themselves in secure positions, who were academically engaged in thinking about things and writing about things, but doing wasn't part of the, of the culture. So the, the first thing that I had to do, I realised this and I thought, I wish it was different because now I'm going to have to get rid of a lot of these people and I need to recruit the sort of people that we need to take on these challenges. And I guess what kept me going through that process, which took 12 months and was really difficult because it's not easy letting people go um, and changing structures and dealing with the unions and all that, was that I could see the new people that were out there that wanted to come in, that were available, were risk takers and were energetic and were technically competent, but they weren't interested in organisations that weren't going to do something. In other words, what attracted the most is if you could make them believe in you that we're going to go somewhere. Ah, they said, right, okay, now you've got me. I'll be there. But if, we're, if it's just going to be a comfortable life, no. Which worked well because I didn't want people in there for a comfortable life. The organisation didn't need people there for a comfortable life. The task that was required was going to be extremely uncomfortable. Um, but it was, and this never gets written up in, in many of the journals, although I know Per and his team have been looking at some of these factors. But it was, if we hadn't gone through that 12 month phase of reorganising and getting the sort of uh, risk takers involved um, with the passion to do the task, then we could never have done the task. So if I'd come in as CEO and just said, well, we'll make do with what we've got, you know, they're good people, and they were good people, and they are good people, um, it wouldn't have worked. So you have to be prepared to take some hard decisions and um, to achieve the long-term long gain. We went through a process then, uh, which was probably at the intense period, about three years long, um, in the very intense part of it. We had over a thousand public meetings along the coast. I don't know, we had 33,000 submissions or something like that, written submissions that we came back to analyze. We had public meetings with 500 people present. Um, we had death threats. Uh, we had um, a lot of support uh, from, from organisations. WWF was strongly supportive and played a, weren't just supportive, but played a key role in, in, in if you like, moving the goalposts further down, saying that we needed to go further and harder than what we were. That was useful political dynamic to have in play. Um, but essentially it was a team of people, and I know people always stand up and say, oh, it was a team, you know, that did it. You can't do an exercise like this if it's not a very cohesive, motivated team. And, you know, I hear people say, oh, I was responsible for the, for the rezoning of the Marine Park, or, you know, he was responsible for the rezoning of the Marine Park, and that's absolutely not true. The organisation, the team was responsible for this outcome, and that's what it looked like afterwards for the fact that in both Houses of Parliament it was supported unanimous, unanimously in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, it was an overwhelming politically successful venture 
and I would argue a successful con conservation venture and a venture which will set up, set up the economic activity in the park on a good basis for, for a long, long time to come. Um, it's been written up as a, in some places as a technical exercise. Uh, I'd like to you know, recognise the work that the Resilient Centre is doing looking at the human factors that were behind this success. The human institutional and organisational factors because the reality is that in those factors lies the, lies the um, success, the, the reasons for success. So I know people want to say it was Marx and it was this computer program, it was this science that did it. That's not true. That science had been around for 10 years. It was laying moribund in the bottom of the basement. Um, it was really the human element, the leadership that Virginia brought to it, but the fact that the whole organisation focused on this task um, to get it done. So, I want to make that point that it, was, it was really was teamwork and it was about working out how you're going to go forward and then relying. And teamwork is about trust and energy um, and not just wanting to stay safe, take risks as well. Now, many of the people that were involved in that exercise have moved on because they got bored quickly afterwards. They decided they'd done what they had to do and so they should move on. And, and that's, you, you expect that as well, and I don't think we should be that disappointed um, about that when it occurs. Um, there's some negative consequences that came out of it, but I think I'll leave those for now. I just wanted to talk about one other aspect too. Sorry, this is a little disjointed. This occurred to me as I was putting this together. It was, um, one thing I think we really need to get better at is this issue of passing the ammo. So I, I come across great science and technical expertise in my travels around the world, all over knowledge for that matter. Um, when I'm down in places like Papua New Guinea or Solomon Islands. And I, and I also come across some frustrated but dedicated managers and policy makers who perhaps if well equipped with the information can make a difference. I think where we do well to invest is in developing those brokers, if you like, or entrepreneurs who are very astute at taking the science and packaging it both at the local level and the global level and in between at the regional level, packaging it for policy makers and, and managers. In other words, these people who can are comfortable in both worlds. They're comfortable in the research and the science world and they're comfortable in the management and policy world. Um, they're good at getting managers to identify their questions, which managers are often not, don't do well. You know, what is it you actually need and what do you want to do with it? Um, but can then also connect it to the researchers. This, this role of, of, you know, as I say, globally passing the ammo I think it's an area that we, we, we need to develop a cadre of expert, expertise in and quickly because to continue having this gulf between technical knowledge and practical application and policy um, is consuming far too much time and energy. I'll skip past that. That was you know, the um, payoff for the politicians, I guess, who, who led the uh, rezoning. Just quickly on the, on the Coral Triangle initiative because I was asked to speak about this. So this is the initiative of six countries down in um, Southeast Asia and the Pacific that um, is a political initiative at the moment, looking for traction, trying to provide a framework to deliver sustainable development in the Coral Triangle, which is the most biodiverse part of the marine, uh, global marine ecosystem. And the reason I put that slide there is just to show that sometimes you have to give, we have to be smart at giving politicians not just words to say, but state, state, uh, stages to stand upon, accolades to receive, reasons to step forward and be brave, to be entrepreneurial, um, and articulate for them the legacy that they'll be able to be recognised for leaving behind. And this has been a big part of the process in the Coral Triangle. Because it would be easy for any of these six leaders from, from across the Coral Triangle countries 
to say, look, I've just got to focus on education. What's marine spatial planning, for instance, got to do with my priorities? Uh, and you need processes for, for engaging them and being able to explain to them that it actually will underpin the investments that you make in education and health, in regional stability and infrastructure. Um, it's struggling at the moment, the Coral Triangle Initiative. I think it's one of these ambitious ideas. I really think you know the problems lie in governance, not surprisingly, yeah, as, as we often find in the marine environment or, or poor governance structures. Um, but I think it's something that we need to continue to persist with, put our shoulder to the wheel on, because in a way I, I feel like if we lose the Coral Triangle, this heart of marine biodiversity, it's and, and it's under and it's under severe threat. Don't, don't let anyone ever tell you that it's pristine in that part of the world. I'm sure many of you have visited. Um, it's under severe threat and pressure. But if we lose that, somehow I feel like it's a slippery slope. I mean, what are we left doing? Are we, where are we going to make these gains that really show that we're able to put a line in the sand when it comes to the blue economy? Dana. On a positive note, I just say uh, from a global perspective now. Stopping up, popping up there. In my 30 years or so working in this field, I've, I've never seen such a strong level of interest globally or, or um, focus on the problems of the oceans and the marine environment. It's, um, it's come about fairly quickly. It's um, largely brought about for the wrong reasons, I think. That is that it's crisis driven and, and no more true than the decline in fisheries that's occurred. And people are starting to focus on the fact that there's no more fish in many places and where there is, they're so small that they bear little resemblance to what was there only as short as 20 or 30 years ago. We haven't got to go too far from where we're here now to see examples of major decline in marine ecosystems that people are increasingly aware of. Um, but nevertheless, there's, there's, there's a gathering interest at high levels uh, including in the private sector, interestingly, I've got a, uh, the, the, the World Ocean Summit, which was in Singapore in February this year, where there's 350 people selected from around the world to come together to talk about these issues. The overwhelming majority of them were from business. Um, fishing, yes, but also shipping, um, insurance, investment houses were there saying, and, and very quickly, there's very little time spent at the, at the summit on what's the problem. Everyone said, look, we know what the problem is. People quickly swung, as business does, to so what and what are we going to do about it? And there was an energy and an appetite to keep moving this forward. And a realisation that it's going, to take, it's going to require a globally cohesive response, um, which is going to involve, yes, everyone assume, accepting their responsibilities, each of us as individuals, but also we need some new thinking and some innovation and how we're going to organise ourselves at a regional level and at a, at a global level, and how are we going to invest sufficiently? And I've got the World Bank there because at the moment they're looking at two things. They're looking at facilitating a partnership of interested organisations in oceans, um, a political partnership, an alliance, a, 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 a forum to come together. They're also looking at investing funds in the oceans but it's in ecosystem protection, ecosystem functioning, how do you maintain, uh, do a much better job of maintaining the ecosystem services that the ocean's been supplying and increasingly being asked to supply over the last 50 years. And they believe that from a banking perspective, there's very good cases for large scale investment, mainly in rehabilitation work and mainly focusing on the Asia Pacific realm. Um, which is, which is, you know, they've got a developing country uh, focus, so that's not surprising. And I just make mention of my own organisation, new organisation with WWF, which the reason I've been recruited is because we have an understanding of a need to be more relevant to this debate and a realisation that there's an opportunity for us to make a difference and that there's a wave building um, of concerted effort to deal with the problems of the marine environment. We work across the globe in many places. We have a lot of capacity 
And what I'm being asked to do is organise themselves so that we can um, put our considerable expertise and influence uh, behind the efforts of organisations like the World Bank um, and the private sector as well as governments around the world. So my advice I, uh, is that you need to jump in, even if it's uncomfortable and you feel like you're in over your head. Um, the water's warm, and and uh, the benefits the benefits are there to be had, and the time is right. So thanks very much for listening.